Happy Pride, everyone. You may notice that my voice is completely wrecked. I've been interviewing like crazy. I thought I might speak in a deeper register, which could lend me an attractive air of masculinity. What do you think? Well, this may be the best I can do. I'm Ben Koala, and this is Our Pride, a two-day online extravaganza featuring some of LA's most colorful queer people. And me. We may not be able to gather in person, but it is still Pride. Uh, sorry, to back up, uh, for anyone who's watching in a red state, uh, there's a terrible plague on and we all have to stay indoors. Uh, give it a Google. I shouldn't pick on the red states because even here, in blue old West Hollywood, where I am, fear of COVID seems to have subsided as even high-risk places like gyms are starting to open up. This is, of course, in line with the official West Hollywood motto, give me 8% body fat or give me death. I'll tell you, it was a real chore having that inscribed over City Hall. My point is, if you stick around, we'll give you everything you need for a fabulous pride. Drag queens, trans comedians, leather fetishists, Democrats. We promise you this is going to be everything you've imagined it to be. Anyway, it's 2020. Or as Reagan would say, it's twilight in America. There's a plague on, the police are out of control, and we're being led by a weak, self-important senior citizen who's barely holding on to his faculties. And unfortunately, he's our only hope against Donald Trump. Anyway, I have a terrific lineup of guests for you today. In a little bit, I'll be talking with Lori Jean, the CEO of the LGBT Center in Los Angeles, and we'll round out the hour with city councilman and admitted homosexual Mitch O'Farrell, who's working to alleviate poverty and homelessness and defend the dignity of trans Angelinos. But first, this guest is a real get. She is one of the many heroic lawmakers doing their very best to stave off America's decline. She is an Orange County native who's been in the U.S. House of Representatives since 2003. And among her other progressive bona fides, she's been an outspoken defender of gay rights even since before it was cool. And though she is married to a man, she spent several years playing on the congressional women's softball team. Please welcome to the program Congresswoman Linda Sanchez. Congresswoman, thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. So my first question to you is, is America over? Is America over? No. America oh, okay. is still a great country, but there is a lot we need to improve on. Um, and 2020 has been a particularly challenging year. Oh, how um, so? You know, there has been some great news. There have been, you know, some highlights of good things that have happened. We had an amazing... Supreme Court decision um, the other day that um, protects folks uh, on the job site from discrimination. Are, are you uh, friendly with anyone on the Supreme Court? Do you know any of them personally by any um, chance? Uh, I do know Sonia Sotomayor. Yeah. I have had, um, I have had a, a, she has a group of members, uh, women members of Congress who are attorneys we do like a dinner series, or we used to before stay-at-home orders, but um, right. so I, I've been in her home and had an opportunity to chat with her, but she's the only one. Does she cook or is it takeout? Um, it's takeout. Um, we, we order in just to cut down on the amount of work. Well, what's, what's she so busy with that she can't cook a meal? Come <laughs> on. Um, so uh, you've been a supporter of gay rights for quite a while. You're part of the, um, uh, I'm sorry, the LGBT task force. Tell, Correct my, uh, what I'm uh, calling caucus. it. Yeah, caucus, yes. caucus, yes. Equality caucus or something like that. How, uh, but you were on, on this train in, I think, 2009 you joined? And this was before everyone was, you know, kissing our asses right and left. So why, <laughs> were, uh, what made you such a fan of the gays and all the other letters? Um, so it's really personal for me. Um, I had a cousin, Manny, who was gay and back in 80s, the 1980s, when the AIDS epi epidemic hit, um, he contracted HIV and he actually ultimately died of AIDS. And I get a little emotional about this. He was such a good and loving person. And it was so hard for me to see him demonized and discriminated against and persecuted just because of who he loved. And so I vowed that in whatever way that I could, I was going to try to make a mark in the world to try to increase equality and understanding and acceptance and um, diversity. And so that's kind of been my passion ever since. 
Have you gotten in your career any pushback from that? Anyone saying like, eh, maybe we should go easy on the gay rights stuff? Um, you know, it's hard, but I, I, you know, from very early on in my congressional career, I've really tried to push those issues. Um, before the Supreme Court ever ruled on marriage equality, I introduced a bill to give same-sex couples um, social security benefits that, um, that heterosexual couples receive. Um, I've introduced a bill called the Safe Schools Improvement Act, and that is meant to create a federal standard for all school districts in the country um, towards anti-bullying. It, it, it would make them adopt anti-bullying codes of conduct and make them report the incidences of bullying and harassment because LGBTQ youth are some of the most bullied and harassed. Um, and I actually, I have, I, have a, I have a question, sorry to interrupt you. I have a, I have a question actually yeah. about those bills. I'm not super familiar with the anti-bullying bill, so I may be wrong here, but a part of me were, I mean, well, maybe you can tell me, what kind of consequences do those bills uh, mandate for people who are accused of or or for people who, who are the bullies? What happens to them in these bills? Um, so it's not, it, it's not meant to, they, they are not bills that are meant to punish the perpetrators. It's to try to force institutional change. It's to force every school district to adopt anti-bullying codes of conduct. And it conditions federal funds on them uh, reporting incidences and creating curriculum to teach that that behavior is wrong. Were you ever bullied as a kid? Um, I was bullied as a kid. Uh, I think, you know, it's not unusual for most people to have experienced some kind of bullying as a kid, but, you know, the, the bullying not that me. I... Not me. Everyone has always adored me. Never a negative word said from anyone. You know, the bullying that I experienced was, you know, very isolated. There are kids that are bullied and harassed 24-7 now with electronic platforms. It used to be that if you were bullied at school, you could go home and still find some respite. Nowadays, with all the digital platforms, kids get bombarded 24-7, and it's really destructive. Here's a tricky question. I, my sense is that a lot of people uh, put their weight behind the gay rights movements because they, they, you know, gay and lesbians were becoming more and more visible. Certainly trans members of our society were becoming more and more visible. But have you found that now that a lot of the gay rights have been um, attained, people are saying, well, you know, I was, I was in the movement for the gays, but this trans stuff is not so familiar to me. I'm not really as interested in, in pursuing that, those kind of policies. Have you come across that? Um, I, I do see that once a movement starts to achieve success, uh, people who are not so much affected anymore tend to think that everything's okay. But as Martin Luther King Jr. used to say, an injustice towards one is an injustice towards all. If we as a society want to progress, we have to have equality for everybody. And as you've seen with the recent Black Lives Matters protests, you know, as much as we'd like to think that discrimination is has ended and that there there is no more discrimination, that's not true. It still exists. It's very systematic. And we have to root it out for everyone because we can't totally be a country of freedom and liberty until every person has the same right to walk down the street and feel safe in their own skin. Now I have some completely frivolous questions to ask you, and I hope that you'll uh, indulge me. I thought we'd play just a little game with you. Uh, because we don't have a ton of time, this is going to be a lightning round. Um, okay. So. I don't want you to think too hard about these questions. You know, it's just kind of off the top of your head. Um, and it's only uh, 50 questions or so. So, you know, it shouldn't okay. take too long. All right. So uh, first question, chicken or fish? Fish. Red or white? Why? Red. Apples or oranges? Apples. Apples or PCs? I'd say Mac. Do you watch sports? I do watch sports. Where would you want to live if not America? I would want to live in Dubrovnik. American Idol or so you think you can dance? American Idol. HBO or Netflix? Netflix. Family Feud or Price is Right? Family Feud. Who's the better cook, you or your husband? I am. Do you cry during sad movies? Yes. I ugly cry during sad movies. Celebrity crush? Uh, Ryan Gosling. Girl celebrity crush? Um, Salma Hayek. Do you procrastinate? 
Uh, I used to procrastinate it a lot. I procrastinate it a lot less now. Would you rather be old and wise or young and indifferent? Old and wise. Lakes or beaches? Beaches, honey. I'm from Southern California. Pizza or pasta? Ooh, that, uh, pasta. Chinese or sushi? Sushi. Mushroom or pepperoni? Mushroom. Letterman or Leno? Letterman. Kimmel or Fallon? Um, Kimmel. Do you smoke? I did once, but not anymore. Are you telling the truth? I am telling the truth. I smoked during finals week in law school, and then I stopped. What's your worst habit? Leaving like a three quarters empty can, can of soda lying around. Hmm. Mine is constant self-sabotage, but that sounds nice for you. <laughs> can you sing? No, I cannot sing to save my life. Would you rather have one true love and a job you hate or a job you love but no one to come home to? Um, I think a job I love but no one to come home to. Do you like wearing makeup or is it a chore? Most of the time it's a chore. Occasionally I like wearing it. Eggs or pancakes? Pancakes. Blueberries or strawberries? Strawberries. Gold or silver? Silver. Friends or family? Family. Friends or extended family? Friends. Cake or pie? I'm gonna go with pie. Do you like facial hair on a man? Uh, no. Dogs or cats? Dogs. Who was your first crush? Um, a boy by the name of Andy Stanley. What was so great about him? He was really sweet. He used to carry my clarinet home from school. Are you on Facebook? Uh, I am officially, not individually. Do you ever get into fights on social media? I try to avoid fights on social media. True or false? Children are the wisest of us. True. True or false? Age brings wisdom. False. True or false? Some lies are good. True. Who was better looking, Gerald Ford or Ronald Reagan? I'd say Ronald Reagan. Who's better looking, George W. or Mike Pence? George W. True or false? It's always darkest before the dawn. True. Honesty or loyalty? Honesty. Faith or skepticism? Uh, I like a healthy dose of skepticism. Humor or humility? <gasps> I love me some humor. Hotel or Airbnb? I don't think I've ever stayed at Airbnb, so I'm going to have to say hotel. <laughs> oh, it's fabulous. You get to look through these people's things. It's terrific. You got to give it a shot. And finally, are you happy? Am I happy? Yeah, I am happy. Good. Um, well, thank you so much for doing this. You've been a great sport. Um, terrific answers. Before I let you go, is there anything else you wanted to touch on? The census is still ongoing. There are still many people who have not stood up to be counted. It's critically important because it determines the amount of federal funding we get for things like early childhood programs, job training programs, health, uh, health centers and, and clinics, um, many things that make our quality of life great. So please, if you haven't filled out your census form, please, please, please fill that out. And please, this November, go and vote. When you vote for people that share your values, you get elected representatives that make good policy. Very That's well said. Question. I'll buy it. And I did fill out my census form, just so you know. Good. You get a gold star. Woohoo! Um, all right. Thank you again. Happy Pride to you. And um, best of luck. And please save us. We'll I do will. I'm working on that. I'm working okay. on it. All right. Thank you so thank much. You. Now I'd like to welcome to the show a fantastic lesbian. She's currently the CEO of the Los Angeles LGBT Center, but she's also served as executive director of the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force. She worked in the 80s and 90s for FEMA, and she's twice been named by Out Magazine one of the most powerful gays and lesbians in the nation. Please welcome local sapphic hero, Lori Jean. So... I'm here with Lori Jean. Lori Jean is the 
It's, she's on her third stint as the CEO of the LA LGBT Center. Her second stint. Oh, it's your second? Yes. Are you sure? Because I... <laughs> I'm positive was, six years in the 90s and this time yeah. since 2003. And in between, I ran the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force. Well, we can pretend that I asked that question accurately or the question I'm about to ask. My question is, uh, unlike your first time at the LGBT Center, um, now we're, you're, you're back in power now at a time when being LGBT is in many ways a lot easier than it was 20 years ago. Um, and we certainly have a lot more political power. Uh, so I wondered if that's changed the energy at the center or in how you view your role. Well, you know, it's certainly true uh, that things today uh, are a lot better. We've made a lot more progress for some LGBT people uh, than we had in the 90s. But, um, you know, just about the time that you think you can see that trajectory and, and how you're actually going to finally achieve full and complete equality, then something happens like Donald Trump gets elected and begins to chip away at the gains that you've made and reverse them right and left. Laurie, he's been um, enabled by uh, the entire Republican Party, it would seem. You worked in the federal government for in the late 80s and early 90s, if I've done my homework well. Did you, do you know any of the people that you see now enabling him? Were you friendly with any of them? No, you know, uh, none of those people were involved. And, and uh, the Republican Party was a very different uh, place then. Reagan had just sort of taken over. And uh, that's when I went to work in the federal government. It was on, in, under the Reagan administration. And believe it or not, I never worked for 10 years in the federal government under a Democrat. Uh, we always yeah, had- Yeah, I was wondering about that. Yeah. And how and, were they with you? Because you were openly gay at the time, if I... Yes. Um, you know, the, the head of my agency, I worked for FEMA, and uh, the head of my agency who became my biggest fan and greatest benefactor and promoter was, uh, at the time I first met him, uh, a three-star general in the army appointed by Ronald Reagan and African-American. And he was the first black three-star general in the army. And um, he uh, completely supported me. I ended up coming out in a very spectacular sort of way. And uh, uh, I was the elected president of the Gay and Lesbian Activist Alliance in Washington, DC, which was the largest um, LGBT or local LGBT organization there. And uh, the police- I'm sorry, I have to stop you on I came out in a spectacular way. Can we have some details on that? Yeah, well, well so I was president of this, of this group and uh, I was getting ready to tell my boss and General Becton, I was getting ready to tell them uh, that I had taken this position and that I was a lesbian uh, because they didn't know. And uh, um, I was making my plan. Uh, I had consulted with a lot of higher ranking gay people in the government, gay and lesbian people then, we weren't, the B and the T weren't much in our consciousness then, about whether I should do this, take this position, and they all said no. They said it would ruin my career. And thank goodness one of the benefits of youth is uh, boldness and naivete. And so I did it anyway. But I, I hadn't told them yet, I was waiting. And then while I was waiting to implement my strategy, the police raided a local gay bar, and this was during the height of the AIDS epidemic, wearing yellow masks and gloves. And this or was right at the beginning, it was sort of mid 80s. And uh, uh, it was horrible. And so I organized a demonstration uh, on the steps of the um, Washington DC Police Department uh, immediately in the very next day. And I was on all the news and I was in the Washington Post. And so that's how everybody found out. Wow. And did you get, uh, when I walked, was it, walk, oh, go ahead. No, no, I think you're about to answer my question about what it was like walking into the office the next day. You know, it was unlike anything I ever expected and it was horrible. I was, uh, to be a, a little immodest about it, I was a popular employee. I was well-known, a uh, well-known lawyer for the organization. Uh, people liked me a lot and I had a lot of, a lot of friends. And when I entered in the office that day from, when I went through the front desk where the security guards were, I knew them by name. They wouldn't look at me. Oh my God. I walked God. in, I got in the elevator and my colleague, I said, good morning. They would not respond. 
Um, I walk into my office the next uh, on the fourth floor, which was the top floor. And I always walk in the entrance and then go down this very long hall. And all the, as we said, then secretaries were off to the right. And a lot of offices were to the right. And we always chatted in the morning. Well, they saw me coming and half of them turned their faces into the wall and the other half ran out the back door. So they wouldn't have to talk to me. And so I, I bet went you in. couldn't get a date with any of them since. <laughs> well, no, I, would, I definitely wouldn't have done that. I was also the ethics official for the agency. So uh, none of okay. that. Uh, but uh, uh, love so. is love. That's what I say. <laughs> yes, but not when there's a power is, differential in the world. Yeah, sure, right. This is me so, arguing for uh, sexual harassment. You can count on me for these kind of conversations. Yes, that's uh, right. So, yeah. So I went so into what, my so office. Heather, sorry. I closed the door, and a few minutes later, there was the general knocking on my door, opening, and I opened it. He opened it up, and he says, "So, this big booming voice, I saw you on the news last night. I read about you in the paper this morning." My whole career flashed before my eyes. Uh, and I said, yes, sir. He said, well, I just want you to know that I'm very proud that you're a member of the FEMA family. Your security clearance is not at risk because you're clearly out of the closet. And uh, I didn't want you to sit here and worry about that all day. And then he left. And he did this where everybody could hear him. And woo, oh. like wildfire. And then people weren't afraid to show support to me anymore. Did people apologize to you? Uh, no. It all was happening so fast. I think, you know, this was not at a time when people came out in jobs like these. And uh, they just didn't know what to do. And um, so, uh, and it all went really well from there. And then he promoted me. Uh, I became the highest ranking openly gay uh, employee in the entire federal government when I was promoted to become deputy regional director of FEMA's largest and busiest region, which was headquartered in San Francisco. And uh, um, so, uh, you know, he was very good to me. All right, so here's my, <clears throat> uh, here's my question that's gonna piss people off. Um, so, the LGBT Center helps homeless queer youth, uh, unemployed trans people, LGBT seniors, and among other uh, groups and services. Um, at a time when the general social safety net is either very stingy or non-existent. Do you think there's a case to be made that at least for those who are in need of services, there's an advantage to being LGBT? Uh, you know, no, I, I wouldn't say that. Um, LGBT organizations don't get nearly the amount of government money uh, that, um, that we should get given the percentage of the population that we are. Uh, foundations do not give to us uh, it, to nearly the extent that they should. Some of the big foundations uh, in California um, don't even get, and in LA, don't even give the Los Angeles LGBT Center any significant money. Some do, and more do, do now than ever before, but it still is not in relationship to the percentage that we are in the population or the nature of our problems and issues or the amount of money that some of these folks have actually gotten from LGBT people including, say, corporate sponsors. Just to sort of uh, be obnoxious here I, <laughs> and poke the spare, I guess. You know, I mean, every LGBT youth has the same resources that a non-LGBT youth, homeless youth might have, plus services like the LGBT Center. Well, here's what I would say. You're forgetting that LGBT youth uh, often do not feel safe or welcome or um, understood when they go to a mainstream homeless homeless services provider for homeless youth in LA. Well, That's sure. why they want to come to us. And we are the only, the only homeless services provider for homeless youth specifically dedicated to LGBT people in all of Los Angeles. Uh, we operate now, um, if you count everything, uh, probably we're close to 175 beds, maybe even 200 depending on our scattered side apartments for homeless youth. Uh, in, uh, in, and, and that has just grown exponentially with the opening of the Anita Mae Rosenstein campus. Countywide, uh, there are probably, I don't know how many beds there are right now, but probably um, maybe a thousand. Uh, and, uh, and our youth don't feel safe uh, going, to, uh, going to mainstream providers. So, 
technically, can they go there? Yes. Is it better today than it was in the 90s when I used to fight with the heads of these other homeless services organizations who were uh, taking away condoms from our youth? Uh, yes, it's better. But still today, we have complaints of uh, workers in some of these other places who are trying to get our youth to convert uh, and to give up homosexuality because that's oh a sin. God. So, you know, it's better. Ben, you're right, it's so much better. But, uh, but I, I still wouldn't say by a long shot that the queer people uh, have it better when it comes to social services than, than does the rest of the population. Before I let you go, I wanted to play a little game with you. Um, as the CEO of the LGBT Center, um, I figured that you would be an authority on this. And uh, so I, uh, you know, a lot of people wonder about the plus in LGBTQ uh, plus. And uh, there's, a, there's several popular new acronyms. One of them is uh, LGBTQQIP2SAA. Uh, I wondered if you could tell us what each of these letters uh, stands for. Okay, now you did them in an order, so you might have to give them to me again. So LGBT, of course, we all know what those are. And what were the next ones? Uh, the next one is Q. Queer or questioning. Okay, the next one, I'm following them is Q. Okay, great. I. Intersex. P. Uh, T, well, T or T, T, P, P is P is in, P is in uh, Oh, polyamorous. Keto. Polyamorous. I'm sorry, that is not correct, Lori Jean. It's pansexual. Shame on you. Okay, well, synonym. Uh, arguably. I think mean, there may be a, a number of synonyms here. Uh, two, this is, I'm making this easy for you. I'm putting, putting it together. 2S. Uh, uh, Two-spirit. Very good. And then the last two are AA. What are, the, what are those? Well, it's got to be asexual and ally. You know, I've seen ally. I think it could be ally. Well, according to this source, it's uh, um, uh, androgynous, which to oh. me seems like a word that kind of sums up a, a bunch of them. I can hardly keep up, Ben, anymore myself. I mean, I run the biggest LGBT organization on the planet, and I can't keep up. I'm going to give you another acronym, uh, okay. just, just while we're here. Okay, the next one is... Uh, LGBT I Q C A P G N C F N B A. I feel like I'm at the eye doctor. <laughs> you got me on that one. <laughs> really? Come on, Lori Jean. By the way, does anyone does everyone call you Lori Jean? Except for the people who really are close to me. Uh, but even people who I've known for many years and, and who damn well know Jean is my last name. They just I know, can't but it's so irresistible. Off their tongue. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I hope it has been a fact. I mean, I should be calling you Ms. Jean. I, I, I apologize. Oh, Lori. That, no, no, too. no. Lori. Call me Lori. Okay, good. Uh, thank you. Appreciate that. All right. Well, in case you were wondering, LGBTIQCAPGNCFNBA is intersex, or there's LGBT, which we know. Intersex, queer, curious, asexual, pansexual, gender non-conforming. Oh, GNC, sure. Mm -hmm. GNC. Do you want to yeah. do you want to take another another guess at GF? Gender fluid. Very good. And the non-binary. Very good. And then A. Oh, well, goodness, we went through, through this we before. Went through, yeah, I've already told you. It's, it, this one is also androgynous. I mean, this is a list of synonyms. What, what is, gender nonconforming, gender fluid, non-binary, androgynous. It's all ways of saying androgynous. Am I just an, an ancient, crotchety old, cranky man? Well, this is androgynous. You know, That's the word for that. We, you know, a lot of us might be cranky old, crotchety people when it comes to this alphabet soup. But here's the concept, right, that nobody should disagree with. Everybody needs to feel welcome and included. This is why I like queer. Queer is great. Queer is a fabulous umbrella. Anything that's at least a little off, queer. I love it. That's, that's what we you know, that does might just my two cents. Especially some of our seniors that doesn't work for. Uh, because that's, they, that's, that's a very painful term for them. It right. was used as an epithet. They haven't uh, 
felt like reclaiming it because it wasn't anything they ever wanted to have to claim. And so, you know, there is no one word that really works for everybody. Um, but, uh, but I think if there is one, queer probably is the closest. Is there anything else that you'd like to touch upon that we haven't uh, covered? You know, um, yes. You know, here we are, we're, we're celebrating pride at a time that is uh, very challenging for anybody who cares about uh, social and racial and economic justice. And it's especially challenging for um, black LGBT people who uh, not only must deal with discrimination and bigotry and oppression because of their sexual orientation and gender identity, but because of their race. And now all of these things are sort of happening at the same time. And uh, I, I would just say that uh, to all the, the uh, everybody out there, I would say now is the time to try to be kind and patient with each other. Uh, and uh, for all of us, especially uh, folks who are not black to be thinking about what can we do? What should we do to both better educate ourselves uh, about the experience of our um, black friends and colleagues and, uh, and family members? Um, uh, and what can we do to try to move the needle uh, on social justice issues and uh, anti-black violence? If you could do one thing, if you look at uh, America's uh, racial tensions or, uh, sure, well, just that, what's one thing you would do to, if you had a magic wand and you could be like, oh, this might fix a good deal of this, what would it be? I would, um, I would give black people the most of the power in this country and see what happened then. I would make us all black. <laughs> there you go. Um, all right. Thank you so much for, for being here uh, or for being where you are and uh, sharing a computer screen with me. And uh, happy Pride. All right. Well, happy Pride to you, Ben. And uh, good luck with all the rest of your interviews. Um, thanks for taking the time to do this. And I'll look forward to seeing everything when it airs. Before we move on, I'd like to take a break to reflect on some of the ways life under coronavirus has changed. It's a segment I'll simply call Before Coronavirus. Before Coronavirus, I didn't realize that the concept of time was a social construct. After all, what is bedtime? I'm not really sure which part of my day now wouldn't qualify as bedtime. Before Coronavirus, I didn't know anyone used Zoom with their clothes on. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm impressed with your temperate use of the internet. Before coronavirus, I didn't know that New Zealand had been civilized. Now apparently it's the most advanced nation on earth. Who knew? Before coronavirus, I had a number of promising matches on Tinder. Now, there's no point in living. Before coronavirus, I was under the impression that the only thing keeping me from reading tons of books was time. Now I realize the only thing keeping me from doing anything is Twitter. Before coronavirus, masturbation was something I looked forward to. Now it's just the thing I'm doing. Before coronavirus, I suspected America was a failed state. Now I have no doubts about it. And finally, before coronavirus, I identified as gay because before coronavirus, I had a sexuality. And now I'd like to welcome my next guest. My next guest has served on the LA City Council for the past eight years. He's an Oklahoma native, which in my book makes him a carpetbagger, but he seems like a pretty good guy to me. His recent achievements include hosting the city's first ever summit on poverty, opening a new homeless shelter in Hollywood, and helping to secure funds for at-risk trans sex workers. Please welcome every Republican's nightmare, Council Member Mitch O'Farrell. Oh, Councilman, thank you so much for being here. Ben, thank you so much for having me. It's great to see you. I love what, you're, what you've got around your neck. What is that? Uh, can I oh. see the entire piece? Yeah, it's my bandito. It's my COVID, oh, okay. COVID band, you know, bandit mess. And I also have this underneath when I need it. Oh, perfect. I was out and about this morning. I'm, I'm out in the district a lot. Uh, so it's important, you know, that we all have the protection we need. I, I agree. You're at home now. I mean, you know, make yourself comfortable here. I want you to feel at ease. Well, thank you. T I appreciate yeah. that. 
Anything I can do, please. Um, anyway, so we are here uh, in the time of COVID, and um, I wanted to ask you, first of all, um, what percentage of the LA City Council members would you say still haven't figured out how to use Zoom? Uh, everyone's figured out how to use Zoom, but I think what's tripping people up still after all this time is the mute button. Oh, yeah. What have you overheard? Anything juicy? Uh, I heard one little, one little incident of name calling. <laughs> what was called? Spill it all. Spill it, the tea. It was, yeah, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a cuss word. It wasn't anything too, too terrible. So, uh, but I will divulge no names. Yeah, well, what can I expect, politician here? Um, so, uh, Councilman, you are, how many gay councils, uh, council members are there actually on the city council? There are two of us. It's myself and Mike Bonin. I represent the 13th district, he represents the 12th. Which of you is sorry, better Mark, looking? Uh, Mark, you cut, you, stood right, you stepped right on my joke. That was I'm terrible. Sorry. sorry. I gotta start this whole thing over. No, I'm kidding. Um, did you hear the question? It was very important. We'll move on. Earlier this month, we had the All Black Lives Matter March. Um, and of course, Black Lives Matter is now a huge part of the national conversation. I wondered what effect these demonstrations have had on you as an American, as a city council member. Something that's interesting is that these protests for uh, anti-racism, right, and against institutional racism uh, have coincided with uh, uh, LGBT History Month, Pride, which was built on protests against police uh, brutality and oppression uh, back in the 60s. So there are very strong similarities. And our civil rights movement was built with diversity built in. Uh, so I've been reflecting on that a whole lot and how because of what happened in the 60s, we changed the world. I didn't, but our predecessors changed the world for us. So I know that the power of peaceful protests uh, can help change the world. And I think that we're living in the times right now uh, that demand that we work for change. Um, and that's what's speaking to me loud and clear right now. Can you tell us about the, the Midnight Stroll? That's one of your, as I understand it, signature initiatives. So the Midnight Stroll, well, let me back up. The, the focus, my focus within the LGBTQ community since being in office has been to really help uplift and raise the visibility of our transgender community. Um, that is a community of neglect and marginalization, and they suffer said, some of, of the effects were, of you know, institutional discrimination the, as well. The Stonewall era, so but, uh, I've been working era, very closely but, um, with our transgender you, advisory council well, for out? years. Did you start being out of those conversations came the Midnight Stroll, where we do outreach along Santa Monica Boulevard and other locations now. Um, and, and really focus on sex workers, quite frankly, uh, that can be found within the transgender community, oftentimes uh, undocumented, non-English speaking transgender women who sometimes feel that they have no societal support at all. So we're focusing on uplifting that community and we find housing, we find shelter, housing and resources and medical care uh, and we're putting more and more dollars into this every budget year. And so we're working with the community, with the Transgender Advisory Council and um, the Los Angeles Police Department and their uh, arm, their branch that works with LGBT uh, issues. Have you always had a Jesus complex? <laughs> Uh, a Jesus I mean, here you are. You, I mean, you really are like, I mean, this is legislation or it's an initiative anyway that is catered towards a small group of, of particularly vulnerable people in society that I would imagine don't have a huge number of champions on the government level. And so it's rather, I'm, my next question actually is how difficult has it been to get this money? I mean, do you get resistance in City Hall when people are like, you want us to spend money on transgender sex workers? Like, really? I mean, is that, do you come up against that? I, uh, I don't accept no for an answer. And I have a team that's very strategic with how we approach the budget. So I'm a big believer in making a strong case and being relentless with that case uh, and making other people believers in the mission, in the missions that, that I adopt as well. 
Have you thrown a tantrum in City Hall at any point? <laughs> oh, I have. Oh, I've, I've, I've stood up and, you know, had my, uh, my moments. Tantrums, no, you know, not tantrums, but- What's been your best zinger? What was my best zinger? Well, I won some really good battles. I won the battle to regulate e-cigarettes just like tobacco. And that was, uh, it, well, I was a few months in office and I won that one. And the, the, the tobacco lobby came out after me. They went after me on radio and everything else, but we won. That must have felt good. It felt good. talking about me on the radio, fantastic. Right, and then the battle to replace Columbus Day with Indigenous Peoples Day, I won that battle as well. Um, I'm from Oklahoma, I'm a member of a Native American tribe. I get on the Los Angeles City Council and I learn that not only do we just celebrate Columbus Day in LA because it's a national holiday, but Columbus Day is on our administrative code. Now, anyone who's of Native American heritage uh, or is a student of history understands that Columbus was responsible for initiating one of the greatest genocides known to mankind uh, and the annihilation of Native Americans and the erasure, et cetera. He um, helped begin that entire process that, that Native Americans still live with to this day. So I felt it was very important that we remove that from the city's administrative code and then flip the switch and honor Native Americans who made it possible for all of us to be here and prosper to this day, especially right here at City Hall that was built on Tongva land. So it has well, a meaning. The people who opposed those changes, I assume there were some people in City Hall who didn't want to do that. Yes. What were their arguments against it? Have they, and do you ever interact with them? In this particular debate, uh, I, I, someone claimed that I was uh, creating, um, uh, what, what was the claim? That I was creating a, uh, a, a racial division. That was the claim, that I was creating racial division. I said, no, you don't understand, I'm healing one. Yeah. yeah, right. I'm and healing. it was already created, you know. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. So, so that, that was, you know, I, I try to, I just, here's what I do. I try to build a really strong negative, uh, narrative rather, a really strong narrative uh, in a case that I believe in or a cause that I believe in. And then I'll talk about it with anyone. And sometimes people can push me back and I can reevaluate an approach or think, you know what? Yeah, we can compromise on that. Or so, you know, what policy making is all about. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna ask you some fun questions. Okay. If you don't mind. No. Uh, how'd you meet your husband? Okay, so way back in the day, uh, I met my George. Uh, first of all, I was, I was waiting tables in a restaurant downtown. It was 1992. And you were and an actor. I was. I, in, in how'd fact, I know? I was kind of coming out of that. I had just done a couple of contracts on ships and I was, uh, you know, I was doing the, like the cabaret shows on ships for a while, and uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to be back in LA. So anyway, uh, he would come to the restaurant, and then I saw him socially. I was with a group of friends. He was with a group of friends, and we saw each other socially, um, and that's when we really met, and we got along. And then about, well, several months after that, uh, we began seeing each other, um, and that was in late 1992, and we've been together ever since. Okay, so you had a one night stand, and then a few months later, you <laughs> had a date, is what, is, it, is what it, happened. It was much more complicated than that. I mean, no, I'm sure, I'm sure. <laughs> um, okay, great. Uh, next question. This is a line from one of my favorite movies, The Broken Hearts Club from uh, 2001. Uh, LA guys are a bunch of tens looking for an 11. Discuss. Gosh. Well, at my age, I'm so not hung up on looks and appearances, um, but I, I know where that comes from. Think about this. People come to Los Angeles uh, to reinvent themselves, where it's really okay to spend a lot of time on your appearance. And uh, I'm far better looking than I was ever meant to be. <laughs> I'll just say that for myself. Here's the deal. I used to spend so much time when I had a thick head of black hair on my hair. And now I look back at those days and think, what 
on earth was I thinking, I'm now sort of like wash and wear, ready to go and I'm out the door. Hold I on a sec, I hadn't noticed your hair. Can you come a little closer just so we can get a full set? Now, have you, have you ever done a full shave? No, I've never shaved my head. You ever thought uh, about it? Uh, no, but my hair is getting pretty thin, so it might be inevitable anyway. I find but a I, shaved head very appealing. Really? I, oh, I think yes, I have a, it's so strong. I think I have a very strange shaped head. So, you know, it's some people- like a head. Well, you know, some people have a nice shaped head, some people don't. Well, whoever told you you don't have a nice shaped head, you gotta cut that person out of your life because you've got a great head and it should be seen. Uh, I, I thought I might quiz you um, uh -oh. on some, uh, some, of these, some of the laws of our city because you know, you're an authority and uh, I just, I wanna get a sense of, I don't know how much uh, Los uh, Angeles's population can trust you on these issues. So um, oh, no. I thought you might tell me, uh, if you could tell me, I'm gonna give you uh, triplets of things. You tell me which of these is illegal in Los Angeles. Um, uh, first question, uh, flying a balloon higher than five feet, um, wearing oversized shoes outside of a performance venue, like a circus, um, or wearing see-through pants in public. Which of these is illegal? I would, I would guess the balloon five feet high. Well, very good. You got it. I'm a little uh, disturbed to hear that this was only a guess. I would think you'd be a little more uh, up to date on these things, but uh, here's another one. Uh, which of these is illegal? Catching fireflies, killing spiders, or hunting moths under a lamplight? Gosh. Well, I would hope that catching fly fireflies is illegal because that's, you know, we need our fireflies. And that could harm the them. firefly community is really underspoken for. So it's good to hear you say that. Not enough people um, are talking about this. And I don't kill spiders in my house. I release them outdoors because they have their purpose as well. Yeah. Oh my! You're really pandering to the spider community here, aren't you? Well, you know, all animals, all living things, um, and moths. You know, I, I'm totally stumped on this one. Ha! Huh. It's the moths one. Can't, huh. it, you can't hunt moths under a lamplight. I guess you could do it some other way, but not under a lamplight, which is, of course, the most effective way. So, you know, okay. LA is really looking out for its moth community, apparently. Um, all right, here's another one, which is illegal. Um, using a sponge for longer than a month, uh, sharing the same straw at a restaurant, or bathing in another person's bath water. That is wild. Okay, so I don't know how you could regulate bathing in another person's bath water, especially if it's in your own home. So that's kind of weird. Drinking out of the same straw. People share straws all the time. They shouldn't. In fact, in fact, people should not use plastic straws at all because they harm marine life. And I have a, a plastic straw ordinance in place in LA. That was that's one of- That's good. I got nothing against those. I mean, those paper straws are horrible, but you know, let's just not use straws. There should be a ban on paper straws. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> Use our lips, we'll, we'll sip like normal people. I, All right, sorry, you were saying? No, I'm here to tell you that you can drink a smoothie and you don't need a straw to drink a smoothie. Just have it blended a little thinner. Um, okay. What was the first one? There's straws and bath towels. Uh, oh, uh, uh, I don't know. It's been scrolled away from the screen. Hold on a sec. <laughs> Using a sponge for longer than a month. Uh, Again, how could you regulate a sponge in your own home? Straws, maybe I'll do straws then since that's in the public. It, it, is, it is not straws. It is apparently illegal to bathe in another person's bathwater. All right. Well, yeah. we some work cut out for me, don't I? Well, you and your husband can't take showers together anymore. That's what that means anyway. <laughs> I'm, I was a little, a little graphic. A little personal. Excuse me. A little personal. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to disrespect you, Councilman. Um, so, uh, finally, uh, which animal is it illegal to lick? A snake, a dolphin, or a toad? Dolphin. Wrong. A toad. Toads apparently will get you high, or they, they could. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I have a bad so, joke, but I won't uh, say it. Uh, well, now you have to. I was going to say, who hasn't licked a toad? But... I, I, I wasn't going to say it.
Yeah. I haven't licked a toad today, I'll tell you. Uh, anyway, um, well, you've been uh, a, a great sport. Um, thank you for engaging me on all of these various uh, important issues, uh, some more important than others. Um, and uh, hope you have a very happy Pride. Thanks, Ben, and you as well. Thanks. Well, we've run out the hour here, so that's it for me. I want to thank my guests, Congresswoman Linda Sanchez, Lori Jean, and Councilman Mitch O'Farrell. One last thought before I go. There's a virus out there that's threatened our sense of security, sickened our friends and family, and made us aware of our mortality. When it first appeared, we didn't know how it was spread, we didn't know how to protect ourselves, and we felt powerless to stop it. And the guy in charge couldn't acknowledge that there was even an issue. But eventually, Ronald Reagan died. And the gay community that emerged from the AIDS crisis was stronger than we ever thought we could be. Can the past give us any clues about how to get through what we're experiencing? Well, 30 years ago, gay men took care of each other. I'm sure we were still awful shallow bitches because you have to remain true to yourself. But those of us who got sick and survived a plague did so thanks to the care and compassion of our friends, because nobody else was coming to save us. Now the guys in charge still aren't coming to save us, except now us is the entire American population. So what can we do? Well, we can look out for our elderly neighbors. We can buy groceries for the sick. We can donate time and money to the organizations that help people affected by this plague. We can wear a mask. And eventually, just like then, the asshole in charge will go away and life will return. And maybe there's a chance we'll come out of this stronger. Well, stay right where you are, because up next, we've got a pride of queens with Illusia. She's going to host a bunch of drag queens, including Rhea Latre, drag race contestant Mayhem Miller, Sasha Colby, and trans drag legend Calpurnia Adams. That's it for me, but I'll be back tomorrow talking with Congresswoman Katie Porter, L.A. County Supervisor Sheila Cool, former West Hollywood Mayor John Duran, and Barack Obama. See you then, and happy Pride!